Welcome to Lecture 13 of Biology 115, entitled Chromosomes. In the previous lecture, we looked at Mendelian genetics, things that follow Mendel's laws. What's interesting about this next sort of lecture, this next sort of topic, is that we're going to take those interesting things that follow the laws and get even more interesting by looking at things that actually don't follow the laws. Now before we actually get into the actual specifics of chromosomes and how they're arranged and how their sort of inheritance can be different than Mendelian inheritance like we said in lecture 12, we're going to do some background. And so we'll entitle this first flowchart uh, just background. And this is of course for lecture 13 entitled chromosomes. So this is some background on chromosomes. Let's talk about chromosomes and the word itself. In terms of chromosomes, what you should understand in terms of this lecture at least is the fact that there were two people. They were named Bovary and Sutton, both of them. So I'm just going to put a dash in between. Both Bovary and Sutton created what is known as the chromosomal, or let's just say chromosome theory of inheritance. This is what they created. They were the first people to state that somehow, some way, chromosomes are the genetic basis of inheritance. In other words, what we can say about Bovary and Sutton is that this chromosome theory of inheritance explains the genetic basis, so let's write that down, explains genetic basis for their predecessor, for Mendelian genetics. Because before Mendel, all he knew was that things get passed on. He didn't understand that there were things called chromosomes that Bovary and Sutton were able to figure out that were the things that got passed on from parent to offspring. So we'll finish this by stating, explains genetic basis for Mendelian inheritance slash laws. So Mendel came up with these amazing and brilliant laws and sort of ways that inheritance happens, but Bovary and Son were able to put a name to the thing that he was referring to. A chromosome specifically was the thing being inherited. And now since we understand that the chromosome was the thing being inherited, we can start to see different things in this specific chromosome that are not the same as the Mendelian inheritance and laws that we established in our previous lecture. In addition, what we can sort of state about this final point right here are two things. We can state that genes have a specific loci on chromosome, okay? This is sort of a fact that comes out of this theory. Genes have specific loci, and we'll just write on chromo for short. So this is not new to you, but this is something that Bovary and Sutton were able to develop and specifically state to sort of explain Mendelian inheritance in a much more genetic manner, let's say. And in addition, what we can state is that the chromosomes specifically, so we'll write chromo or for chromosomes, undergo segregation, segregation and IA. What does IA stand for again? Independent assortment. These were his two laws. Remember Mendel had those two laws, but he never was able to figure out what was completing those two laws. He just said hereditable factors, which we'll get back to in just a second. But now we know that it's a chromosome. And why do we know that? Because of Bovary and Sutton's chromosome theory of inheritance. So this whole lecture is entitled Chromosomes for a specific reason. We're going to be looking at deviations from our Mendelian inheritance slash laws that we've established previously because that's where things get very very interesting and very very unique. In addition, what we're going to be looking at now in terms of background information is somebody who is able to figure out a lot about different non-Mendelian, get used to that phrase, of non-Mendelian characteristics and traits. Thomas Hunt Morgan, a very very important geneticist very, very important Columbia-based geneticist who did an amazing amount of work in the field of genetics that gave us a lot of non-Mendelian laws and inheritance patterns. Specifically, we can state that Thomas Hunt Morgan was the actual first person that provided evidence that, remember that phrase of chromosome, that chromosome specifically. So these guys came up with this theory Thomas Hunt Morgan provided concrete evidence that the chromosome is the location 
of, I'm going to write M's for Mendel's, hereditable factors. Remember all the way back in genetics, uh, in uh, Mendelian genetics, we talked about heritable factors? Well, here they are again, but now we have a real nice genetic evidence-based name that was based off of what Bovary and Sutton were able to create and also based off of Thomas Hunt Morgan's findings and evidence that created this term of chromosome. So, let's repeat this. Provided evidence that chromosome is the location of M's heritable factors. So we have heritable factors, things get, that get passed on. What are they specifically? They are chromosomes. Nothing new here. Moving forward, another interesting thing that Thomas Hunt Morgan did was that he worked with a very, very special organism. He was a scientist, he was a geneticist, he worked in a lab, and just like how Mendel, which is kind of interesting, had a very nice, advantageous, um, let's say, model organism. What was it again? It was, of course, that pea plant. Had those many, many advantages. Thomas Hunt Morgan is associated directly with this organism. Worked with, it was called, or is still called, Drosophila, Drosophila, uh, Melangaster. Write this down, Melanogaster. I'm sure some of you already know what this is. Very simply speaking, this is a fancy way of saying your common fruit fly. So, fruit flies have given us an incredible amount of information in regards to genetics and sort of non-Mendelian genetics specifically because they have many different advantages in terms of their lab capabilities. Just like the pea plant back in the early, I think, 19th century had its advantages in a lab environment, the, Drosoph the Drosophila melangaster, or the fruit fly used by Thomas Hunt Morgan, had the following advantages. What this fly was able to do was that in one mating event, you were able to get hundreds of offspring. That's good. Why is that good? Because you're studying genetics. You're studying passing on of traits. You're studying passing on of characteristics. So it makes sense that you get lots and lots of traits that are observably passed on through just one single mating event. You don't have to go through a hundred mating events to get a hundred offspring. Like, let's say, typically in humans, you would have to do that unless you have twins or triplets. But all you have to do is one mating event with this very easily uh, manageable fruit fly and get hundreds of offspring based off of that. So that's a big advantage. In addition, another advantage is the fact that there are rapid generations in fruit flies. What does that mean? That means that the time between parent and offspring and offspring turning into another parent uh, is very short. So they grow up very fast, let's just say that. And lastly, there's just simple organisms. They only have four pairs of chromosomes, actually. Three of which are autosomes, so I'll write three auto, and one would be what? If you have the autosomes, the other one that's remaining would be the sex chromosomes. One pair of sex chromosomes, three pairs of auto, uh, autosomes. Do you remember how much we had? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 of which are autosomes, and one which is the sex chromosome. Of course, the sex chromosome, if you, didn't, if you forgot, determines sex. We'll talk about this much more in detail um, in a little bit. Now, another thing that we want to understand, some terminology in terms of Drosophila and Thomas Hunt Morgan's work in genetics, are the idea of traits, especially seen in Drosophila. First and foremost, what we have to establish is something known as wild type. So I'm going to write this down, wild type, which from this point forward will be just abbreviated as WT, lowercase. Wild type is defined as, and stay with me for this definition, it's a bit wordy, but it's important. Wild type is defined as the phenotype for a character most commonly observed, most commonly, I'll just say OBS, observed in natural population. Basically, the wild type trait is simply something, the physical trait that is most commonly seen in a natural population. In flies, for example, in Drosophila, fruit flies, the major example, let's say for this purpose, are red eyes. That means that red eyes are normally expressed for the majority of individuals because this is the wild type phenotype. Okay? 
the physical representation that's most common in terms of eye color is red eyes. So that's something that's important. The wild type trait for Drosophila that you should understand are red eyes because they are most commonly observed in a natural population. In addition, if you don't have wild type, what you will have is something known as, and you've probably heard of this, the mutant trait. So you have a wild type trait, now you have a mutant trait. This is simply referred to as the phenotypic alternative, so I'm just going to write ALT for alternative, to wild type. Something that's not wild type. The specific example in fruit flies are white eyes. So when you see a fruit fly with white eyes, it has a mutant characteristic for wild type for eye color. The wild type is red. We see something different here. White, that means we have a mutant trait in Drosophila, at least. And lastly, the thing that we're going to understand is something in referred to uh, that's referred to as notation. Notation is very important in genetics. Notation is something that helps us as geneticists, as biologists, more easily able to understand and recognize patterns and traits that are developed over time. Notation, in terms of the traits in Drosophila that Thomas Hunt Morgan studied, are going to be um, defined as this. For a given character, let's say, for a given, I'll just write C-A-R, for a given character, um, the gene symbol so each gene will have a symbol from this point forward, is always whatever the first mutant is. Now it's a little confusing, but what I'll tell you is that specifically, in terms of Thomas Hunt Morgan and normal naming convention, and I'm going to squeeze this in right over here, if you have a mutant trait of white eyes, that's our first mutant trait, the gene symbol for eyes, therefore, will always, always be W. Now, what about red eyes? Because remember, red eyes are what? The wild type. So would, how would you denote red eyes? Would you just do an R? No, that gets confusing. What you do is you put a W still, but right next to it, you put a plus sign. From this point forward, anytime you see a letter with a plus sign, that means wild type. Do not forget that. And anytime you see a letter without a plus sign, in terms of chromosomal genetics, not Mendelian genetics, but chromosomal genetics of lecture 13, associate that with the mutant. Again, look at this. For a given character, eyes, gene symbol is equal to first mutant. What is the mutant characteristic of eye color? Not the red eyes, but guess what? White eyes. So I'm going to take white, the W, and create that as our notation for this trait of eye color. And my red eyes will be the notation for this trait of eye color in terms of wild type. So overall, in terms of our background, we understand that chromosomes, the specific chromosome theory of inheritance, was developed by Bovary and Sutton. And they were ba basically able to explain what Mendel stated in his laws of inheritance through these two simple steps. In addition, Thomas Hunt Morgan played a major, major role in terms of non-Mendelian genetics. Get used to this phrase right now, non-Mendelian, things that don't follow the Mendelian characteristics and laws. Thomas Hunt Morgan was able to provide the evidence necessary to state that hereditable factors that Mendel mentioned were chromosomes, and he specifically worked with a very, very important model organism known as Drosophila melongaster, or just the fruit fly. He was able to use it because of these advantages, and these are some traits that he looked at. Specifically, understand what wild type means, what mutant means, one is most common, one is not common, and the notation specifically associated with it. Not Mutant phenotype will always be just the letter, and the uh, wild type phenotype will be the letter with a plus sign.